Hi everyone, welcome. It is another BC Poly Hot Stove for today, Wednesday, November 27th, 2019. McLean K, you are two question periods away from being done with another legislative session. Uh, you must be pretty excited. Oh, I mean, I, I, excited is not the word. I, I can lose the tie. I can uh, have a little have a little more time to get things done. Although I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss question period. It's everything else about session that's a bit of a time suck. Yes, yes. Uh, all the random announcements, all the random uh, uh, groups showing up uh, wanting FaceTime, all the little press conferences. Yep. It gets to be a little bit much. Um, by the way, I'm Jordan Bateman. I'm VP Communications <laughs> for Independent Contractors and Business Association. I don't know why you'd be watching this if you didn't know who, who I was. And he, of course, is McLean K, Editor-in-Chief of the Orca. But Hello. You know, one of the, um, you know, having watched this, it's only a five-week session this fall. Mm -hmm. Very little other than UNDRIP has been accomplished. That's true. And I would submit to you, McLean, that if you put John Horgan and Mike Farnworth and Carol James and Adrian Dix and those guys on the uh, truth serum, they would tell you maybe Christy, maybe Gordon Campbell had a point about not having fall sessions. Oh, 100%. Um, there's a reason that governments eventually get away from them is that um, it, here, a lot of people think that when the House isn't sitting that politicians aren't working. Mm. That, nothing could be further from the truth, especially in government, although it's true for private members as well doing work in their constituencies. But a, a lot of the work of government actually gets done when they don't have the, quite frankly, the distraction of the House. An enormous amount of time and resources get, goes into things like preparing for question period. Um, which was part of the reason that in the previous government they moved question periods to the mornings, uh, some of them anyway, two per week, just so that they get them over with yeah. and that ministers don't spend the whole morning prepping for question period because they have ministries to run. And so, yes, um, it's better for accountability and it's better for people like me to have stories um, and uh, if, if fall sessions. But from the government's point of view, uh, it gets awfully tempting to n not have to be here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And look, the whole way behind the scenes the legislature set up, you know, legislation just doesn't magically appear. It has to be drafted. Yeah. It has to be refined. Usually before you draft legislation, you've done a major consultation, you know, hopefully mm -hmm. with your stakeholder groups and beyond to make sure it's right. Like that takes time. And, you know, you jam stuff into the pipeline. Um, but, you know, the fall session with only five weeks of debate, they don't want to put anything too terribly contentious on the floor because they don't want to get hung up at the end of session or have to, you know, God forbid, go into December. So, you know, it, it's, an, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting bird over there for sure. And, uh, yeah, and you're right. There isn't a lot. Again, we're going to shelve under it for a moment because yeah. I think that does is a, is a different animal. But there wasn't a lot in this session that couldn't have waited until the spring. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Look, UNDRIP is uh, historic, but it's also yeah. very vague. Um, yes. You know, kudos to the opposition um, and, and the minister. They seem to have very reasonable, thoughtful debate about, uh, mm -hmm. about the policy and what it's going to mean. I don't think either side felt like they have all the answers. I don't think either side felt like they even knew the questions that they should be questioning sometimes. Like, yeah. there was a lot going on there, but kudos to them for having that kind of mature debate. Now, though, you know, look... The question is implementation. How is the government going to actually, you know, make this happen? And what happens the first time that uh, a government wants to do something that maybe a First Nation isn't so keen on? And I would submit to you, McLean, that first little battleground could be the Massey Tunnel. Yeah, I, you make a really good point because the uh, the First Nation in question was in favor of the other plan for a, a collection of reasons, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I mean, we've talked about this on on this podcast before. I mean, the um, the bridge is actually everything all the other benefits aside is actually more environmentally friendly yes exactly exactly all right well let's get to the big splash uh the big news going right now is actually no news which is there is not a transit strike any longer in uh in greater vancouver they came within a whisker of having a full uh, system shut down today but lo and behold 12 30 a.m after I would suspect some uh, quiet uh, or some hard leaning by the NDP government behind the scenes on both sides. <laughs> it's convenient when your buddy's in labor on one side and when you're uh, controlling the purse strings of the other side. Um, generally, you can get a job done or get the deal done before uh, everything explodes. So uh, great relief here, especially I, I'm in the metro town area. Uh, great relief on the faces of uh, bus commuters here, um, but probably even greater relief on the front bench of the NDP. Oh, 100%. They, they knew very well that they would have to wear a strike. 
Um, they knew very well that um, the public would not have been uh, very happy. I mean, we've seen this happen in um, when uh, essential services go on strike elsewhere, things like uh, garbage collection and indeed yeah. transit. People get really angry, and they're angry at everyone. They're angry at the government for not preventing it. They're angry at the people who, uh, on strike for not delivering the services, even if they're holding out for good reasons. People get upset because they rely on these things for their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, it's been 20-something years since there's been a strike, or 17, 18 years since there's been a strike uh, of the bus system. Looks like there'll be a few more, depending on what this deal is structured. But look, you know, the Unifor national president, Jerry Diaz, shows up in, uh, for these uh, negotiations. He kind of knew that uh, I mean, he, has, he and Horgan have a direct pipeline. There's like a little red yeah. phone in the premier's office where he picks it up and organizes labor answers. Um, you kind of knew that this was all going to uh, sort itself out. Now, that doesn't let them off the hook. Look, UNBC, still mm -hmm. on strike. Um, I know it's in Prince George, and that doesn't seem... Uh, I know it's in Prince George. I'm not sure Harry Baines knows it's in Prince George. Uh, but they've been on strike for three weeks. They're hitting their crunch time. Um, there's still a forestry strike going on on the island, which is mm -hmm. mind-boggling. We consider we don't even have a forest industry anymore, um, in all practical terms. So still some labor disruption, but uh, I, I, I bet this afternoon's question period will have uh, Harry Baines uh, waggling, wagging his finger at the BC Liberals, forever doubting that uh, a deal could be, <laughs> could be accomplished at the table. God forbid. God forbid we got a mediator in there last week yeah. and maybe avoided the brinksmanship that happened. Well, God forbid that people take seriously the threat to, that they would be uh, the service would be canceled this morning. I mean, yeah. this wasn't something that was made up. They said this would happen. And I, I think everyone's happy that a deal was reached, or at least tentatively reached. But, I mean, you can hardly blame the BC Liberals or indeed commuters for being upset at taking threats at face value. Yeah, and look, buses were canceled. C bus was canceled. They, yeah. they, there was impacts for the past three weeks. All right, McLean... Um, one of the other outstanding labor issues is the BC Teachers Federation, yes. and they probably more than anyone were uh, looking very closely at Carol James's financial statement, looking for any wrinkle of, uh, of uh, or any slight little bit of money, any extra dough that they could somehow uh, abscond with. Um, it's tight. Money's tight in British Columbia right now. Yeah, I, um, you know, Carol James delivered her uh, second quarterly update, and we'll talk about that in a second in more detail. But um, I actually, it was me that asked her the question uh, in her avail saying, um, you know, obviously the BCTF is watching this very closely and uh, there's, no, uh, there's no deal. Um, does this mean the fact that the surplus is shrinking, does that mean there's no wiggle room to sweeten the pot? And she was almost uncharacteristically definitive, just no. There's none. The mandate is the mandate, is what she said, mm -hmm. uh, which means that the government is not going to be offering more money than um, the, 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 the policy is a three-year agreement with annual 2% increases. The BCTF obviously wants more. Um, this, look, this is a pretty hard disagreement. Uh, there doesn't seem to be wiggle room on either side. The, the government is not moving, yeah. and it doesn't look like the BCTF is either. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to the same problem that, look, the reason why we have a bus driver's deal is if they'd walked off the job for three days, they would have lost more money than they would have made in, in a pay increase. So, you know, yeah. eventually it comes down just to dollars and cents, right? Like, if you believe the other side, we can't extract anymore. Teachers didn't... Well, let, me, let me rephrase. The Teachers Federation leadership, I don't think, learned this lesson from the last work stoppage. Mm -hmm. I think the rank and file of the teachers have probably learned that lesson. That, look, they walked off the job uh, four or five, was it, six years ago, I guess, and um, lost far more money than they ever got back in a pay increase uh, over that next uh, six years. So you would hope teachers, there's math teachers out there that would be doing the math for their colleagues. <laughs> um, you know, here at ICBA, I was told there would be no math, so I'm not sure. But um, that quarterly report, a few takeaways. Forestry is tanking. Um, yeah. Slight rebound in real estate. We'll, we'll see where that goes. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a two-edged sword for them, though, because Insights West had a poll saying, hey, guess what's the number one issue again? Housing affordability. Yeah. Guess who's not uh, scoring well in their handling of housing affordability? The NDP government. Uh, you know, so prices tick up. That, again, takes away you know, the NDP's kind of soapbox that they've done something there. Um, ICBC is still a mess. That didn't include booking the $400 million or so that EB says will be lost by uh, ICBC mm -hmm. because of these Evans rules. So lots of kind of problems on the horizon. No one, there's no retail sale growth whatsoever, which 
you know, concerning, concerning for sure. So there's all Exports these little are down. Does, yeah, there are some, there are some uh, storm clouds on the horizon. I will say this about Carol James is that uh, she, she is the first to say in these briefings that yes, there are some worrisome signs. Of course, yes, there's, uh, she also underlines things that uh, everything is going well, strong and stable and all that kind of thing. But you know, there are some, are some things to worry about. Uh, you mentioned too, um, we should talk about the ICBC, uh, the $400 million hit uh, which the NDP were very clear would mean $400 million in savings before they had lost and decided not to challenge the court case. They were very clear about this. They said it over and over again, $400 million, $400 million. Now, all of a sudden, it's, well... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was. It might, it might be four hundred. It might be less. Yeah, um, might there, less. There is good reason that it wasn't included in this quarterly update, and that's because they decided not to appeal it last week. Okay, yeah. fair enough. That does mean in the next quarterly update, they are going to have to at least... Um, announce how they will account for it if they're going to spread it out. But make no mistake, this is a $400 million hit. I did think it was very interesting that Carol James uh, and the ministry did go to the trouble of increasing um, the contingency funds, which is basically their their rainy day fund, from $400 million to $500 million. So if they had decided to just take the $400 million in a, a one-time hit, they could conceivably do so out of contingency and still had the teensiest little bit of wiggle room left, but they chose not to do it this time. Yeah. Look, if you're, the, if you're a teacher sitting there and saying, listening to them sit crying poor, you'd say, look, they've got a billion dollars squirreled away in contingency and in forecast allowance. So don't tell me there isn't money there. Um, you know, of all the folks that Horgan could have put into that role, uh, James might, James was by far the best pick. I mean, you know, definitely. Agreed. Fiscally conservative, you know, not fiscal. I wouldn't call her fiscal conservative. Let me rephrase. She's blown through a two and a half billion dollar <laughs> surplus and raised yeah. taxes by six billion dollars. So she's not fiscally conservative. But compare her to David Eby, who has just plunged everyone into deficit immediately, or Michelle Mungall, or um, you know any of the other stars of the bench, Dix. You know, like at least she, you know, is is willing to say no to her colleagues and has yes. the clout and the support of the premier to say no to her colleagues. Um, that, that's an important step forward. Um, but yeah, you know, we talk about they're still balanced, but they're balanced after blowing through a two and a half billion dollar surplus left by the last party and mm-hmm. blowing through six billion dollars more in taxes. So, um, you know, they could be in a lot better position, let's just say. Well, and you're, you're exactly right. I mean, I, I think this is going to be an election issue. This is one thing they got asked, uh, or they, uh, Carol James was asked in the, uh, yesterday was that, listen, if it's going to be this hard to, uh, maintain a surplus and it looks like it, it is, um, why bother? <laughs> why not just go into deficit? And, and, uh, uh, Carol James response was essentially, well, no, we're committed to try and keeping a balanced budget, which I agree with, yeah. but I, I think it does speak to the very real challenge that the NDP might have in two years because it, it, the trend is definitely moving down. Yeah. We've gone from a, a surplus of, what was it? 2.5 billion to now 149 million. Yeah. Um, and this as well, as you say, um, taxes have actually gone up. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, if they've gone into a deficit in four years, then it's it's going to be challenging for them to explain exactly what happened. Yeah, exactly. If you go to BC Poly memes on Instagram, they've got a great chart of the surpluses and it's like the downward curve. And then they have like the little picture of David E. B. doing his yoga kind of sliding down it, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> I haven't seen that. I think it's hilarious, but I'm clearly very immature. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so there's that. Speaking of uh, poor performers, though, on the front bench, I want to uh, give a special shout out to Selena Robinson, who I thought has been fumbling away on this um, big property tax file. Vancouver came out this week and said, uh, the bureaucrats say they needed eight and a half percent or something property tax increase in the city of Vancouver. This is on top of multiple increases uh, in recent years, in fact, recent decades. Um, Bad news because around Vancouver already, small businesses are shuttering. Small businesses pay uh, taxes at a rate of three to one of uh, uh, residences. So, you know, an 8% increase is a lot more money. And of course, these small businesses, many of them are taxed on this weird thing where uh, BC assessment says you should be taxed on you should be taxed on mm-hmm. the uh, final use of the uh, building, not what you're actually using it for now. So if you're in a three-story building now, but it could be a 40-story condo building, you should be taxed like it's a 40-story condo building, literally being taxed on the thin air above you. Todd Stone, to his credit, has been uh, in question period, kind of uh, wailing away, trying to you know get some sort of commitment from the NDP to to fix this. He put in a private members' bill to fix it. Um, you know, 
capitalized on the UBCM and some other groups supporting, uh, you know, fixing this issue. But Selena Robinson just will not come forward with what her solution is going to be. Question period again claims, oh, she's going to have a short-term solution for 2020 and a long-term for 2020, uh, beyond 2020, but no details, no announcement, no paperwork, no consultation, nothing. Um, one wonders uh, precisely when the minister plans to announce to these small businesses what her plan is, since most of them are trying to you know, crunch through their numbers for their budget for next year. And if you caught me, if you're watching this and you caught me chuckling at the beginning of this, it's not because this is a funny situation. This is ridiculous. It's me imagining how George Affleck is going to react to this on this week's Unspun. Jody, George, if you're watching, you should start with this issue and just let George go for half an hour. That's right. um, everything you just said is true. Can you imagine if you were starting at a company and, and the, uh, the federal government said, okay, well, you know, you're, you're starting on the bottom rung now, but if you, if you stick it out for 15 years, you'll, you'll climb the ladder. So we're going to tax you on what you'll earn in 15 years. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Why would you do this to a small business? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, Jim Goddard, I was on with him yesterday on his uh, House Street radio show, and he compared it to a hockey player. Like, you don't, you don't pay the fourth liner what Elias Pettersson's going to get eventually, or you don't pay the fourth liner what Brock Besser gets yeah. today, right? Like, you know, you, you look at what they actually generate now, and this is a huge flaw. It's been, a, a, you know, exacerbated in recent years by the, the changes in, in uh, or the spike in real estate prices. Um, you know, the Liberals have been kind of banging away at this all, se all session, um, and yet, you know, Robinson, I don't know why she just doesn't come out with some sort of answer. My suspicion is whatever answer she has, is she knows is going to be wholly unsatisfactory and is just trying to punt it to beyond question period so she doesn't, you know, beyond the session, she doesn't have to deal with question period uh, uh, digging into it. I, I mean, you have to wonder if at some point the province can't just ban the practice of taxing on, you know, potential. Mm -hmm. um, because, eh, I mean, we've seen there's been stories in the Orca, people like Adis Levinsky and Jody Vance have written about this. But, I mean, things like dry cleaners that are yeah. being taxed as though they're, they're high rises. It's insane. It's crazy. Like, we're not like, we're not saying like the Park Hotel or Trump Hotel. Yeah. We're talking about, you know, these little businesses that really become the fabric of me, the little coffee shops, the dry cleaners, um, the cobbler, uh, the chocolate shop. These are all shutting down. Dunbar is, you know, this long stretch of brown paper. Um, you know, these businesses shut down and your community is hollowed out by it. It's great. Vancouver is unique among a lot of, well, unique among North American cities in, in that they have a good mix of business and residential in every community mm -hmm. in, in Vancouver, including the downtown peninsula. Uh, we had Troy Aikman in for a, um, our ICBA gala last month. He remarked to us, like he couldn't believe how many people actually live downtown. He did, don't yeah. get that in Dallas. You, know, you go downtown and then you go back to the suburbs where you live, right? Uh, but these businesses, if there's no business support underneath it, um, that's big trouble. So you know, little neighborhoods like Kitsilano as well, Mm -hmm. Starting to see these small businesses shut down. It seems like every week in the Vancouver Courier or the Vancouver Sun, there's another story of a business that's essentially being taxed out of uh, out of existence. Well, it's a challenge for Selena Robinson to rein in uh, who I assume is her friend and in, uh, in Kennedy Stewart. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, there's an NDP government uh, in Victoria, an NDP government in the mayor's office, and uh, neither, neither of them seems to give a damn about the small businesses that uh, actually power the economy and employ uh, the majority of people in the community. Um, you want to talk forestry? I just well, once I mean, I'd love to come on and have good news about forestry. Just once. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, you asked me, do I want to talk about forestry? And I, I it's honestly, no, oh. it's, 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 it's sad. It's, it's just, awful. it's really sad. Uh, Dini Moore had a fantastic yeah. piece, uh, last week talking about, um, uh, a real person uh, who's uh, to give an example to put a face on some of this, and uh, she, I, I encourage you to read it because it's just heartbreaking. I mean, this is somebody who has been working for, I'm going to get the numbers wrong. I, I want to say say like 20, 26 years, yeah. and um, I mean, some of the pictures you'll see in the story are, are her taking pictures of oh, this is the last load I'm ever going to process. Yeah, this is the last load of of, uh, of lumber at the sawmill here, and I mean, these people are not. Um, they don't think that this is a temporary. They're worried that this is, I mean, a final. This is the last load. It's not, this is the last load for a few months before we all come back after this all settles out. That's not what's happening. I mean, these companies are, some of them are, are shutting down temporarily, but some of them are shutting down. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, we bad news continues. I mean, there's, uh, you mentioned earlier the, the strike here on the island. Um, that's going into five months now. Yeah. 
uh, communities like Port McNeil, it's not just the workers that are in trouble. It's it's contractors that, you know, getting all the spinoff jobs. Uh, I was speaking with the mayor of Port McNeil yesterday, and she was talking about, you know, uh, the repo is happening up there. People oh. are losing their trucks. Uh, people are coming to actually seize the tools that people work with. I mean, this is dystopian. It's If you're up there... I don't know what to say other than this is unimaginably bleak and I hope it gets better, but it doesn't look like it's going to. Yeah, it it is. It is awful. Um, You know, one of the things that uh, we're planning here is a late spring road trip. Chris and I are going to go visit some members. Uh, Basically we're going to drive up to Prince George and then hang a left and go all the way to Rupert. And, (laughs) um, and it, you know, so it's just starting to talk to a few of the members along the route and, and, you know, what we should see and, you know, 100 mile house. It's like, yeah, come see our shut down sawmill. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's hard. It's, it's, you have no, there's no hope to give these people. There's no, like, government's not coming on a white horse to save you. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is very bleak times. And thank God for people like Deanie Moore who are writing about it and trying to share the, the message with the rest of British Columbia. I just wish that the premier's office would take it a little bit more seriously. I feel like because it's in the north, they don't worry about it as much. Um, or, or it's not, they're not confronted with it as much as maybe they should be. Well, and I mean, they've done things like uh, the, the, the support package for workers, which came out of the Rural Dividend Fund, which is another problem. But, yeah, but um, as, Dean, as Deanie wrote, it's, it's actually very restrictive. And yeah. it, it's not like it actually can feed your family. So, I mean, yes, it's, it's better than nothing, but not a hell of a lot better than nothing. And then the Liberals had a great story of that person who was a truck driver uh, being retrained as a truck yeah. driver on the taxpayer dime, which makes no sense at all. So uh, to our friends in the, in the north and in forest-dependent communities, and what people don't understand is all of British Columbia is a forest-dependent community. Uh, Surrey, Maple Ridge, Kelowna, yep. these, are not, you know, these are not what we would typically think of as forestry towns, but they've uh, seen huge job losses and mill closures as well. Uh, we're with you. We're pulling for you. Um, I, I wish we'd you know, better news for you for Christmas, but this is tough times for you guys for sure. This will be a difficult one to seg out of. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no easy segue there. Uh, why don't you go into, uh, I, we touched on a little bit, BCTF and the NDP. Tell me about convention uh, in Victoria last weekend. Well, I, I mean, I will relieve you by telling you that I did not attend the convention. Oh, thank <laughs> but no, they, uh, the BCTF set up almost like a parallel convention uh, here in Victoria. You should have gone to that um, one. It would have been more fun. Yeah, it's true. The, um, if you've ever been to Victoria, you'll know that the Empress Hotel and uh, the Conference Center are indeed attached. Uh, a lot of people think they're the same facility. They're not. They're just you can walk from one to the other without going outside. The NDP had their co- their convention in the convention center. The BCTF held sort of a gathering, sort of a, a quasi convention, immediately next door. And so I'm told, uh, and they, I mean, and they were wearing different colored shirts, red, which is funny. Well, everyone in the uh, NDP was either wearing orange or just you know we're being festive. Um, for the first time ever. Uh, I haven't had this confirmed, but somebody in the Empress told me this. They actually locked the doors that lead from the Empress Hotel to the convention center. Normally, you can just walk right on through any time, day or night. Um, they locked them. They've never wow. done that before, ever. Uh, so great were the tensions. Um, cool. Look, the BCTF is, is not giving an inch, and I guess to their credit, neither is the NDP government. And uh, I mean, this is all going to come to a head eventually. Uh, isn't it sad when friends fight? You know, like, <laughs> McLean, who's going to get you and I in the divorce if mom and dad break up and the TF oh, and the NDP aren't together anymore? Who'll get Rob Fleming in the divorce? That's the real question. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, I don't know. Like, both, what else can both, we say about the TF? Them, They're crazy. Yeah. They, like, the, the union leadership of the TF is not a normal functioning union leadership. Like, they are militant. They're proudly militant. They say it on their website. They hate everyone. They hate the Socrates. They hate the NDP. They hate the BC Liberals. Um... You know, they stray well beyond their mandate as far as what you would normally think should be in the scope of labor negotiations or what, you know, a teacher's union might normally talk about. Um, you know, God help me, you know, I have a little bit of sympathy for Fleming and, and James in dealing with these, these folks. But, you know, the next time the roles reverse and the liberals are in power and the NDP are on the opposition bench and the TF starts fighting with liberals, the NDP will be right back to cozying up and sucking up to these guys. 
Yeah, well, here's what I think happened. I mean, the the BC Liberals were in power for 16 years, and uh, the BCTF got used to casting them as the you know the implacable enemy. Yeah. And of course, the Supreme Court case didn't help things. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> and so I think the BCTF thought the NDP would just sort of roll over and give them what they wanted. And I think the NDP thought much the same thing, that the BCTF were, you know, a useful ally in the fight against the BC Liberals and were, uh, you know, were going to keep sticking it to them. But now that the good guys were were in Victoria, well, of, of course, we'll start talking more reasonably. And both of them are kind of giving each other the stink eye thinking, you know, well, no, I thought the deal was we'd get what we wanted. And neither one of them is uh, is backing away just yet. Yep. And then you have the added little wrinkle of the only former cabinet minister of the NDP to have strong the strongest ties to the BCTF, former BCTF president Ginny Sims. She's mm -hmm. in uh, she's in the doghouse because well, been demoted because of her uh, uh, allegations and a special prosecutor being appointed for her shenanigans in Surrey uh, to look into them. Um, there's a lot of layers to this little uh, this yes, little fight. indeed. And. Uh, I take it back. I don't feel sympathy. I, for one, am just going to pop some popcorn and enjoy the show. And... Well, I mean, I, I don't see how it ends other than yeah. uh, the, the, the government has been, they're not moving. They, no, they have, it's uh... going to end at the bargaining table, McLean, because that's where deals happen. <laughs> and for 16 years, the other side yeah. screwed up this file. But we know it all gets resolved at the bargaining So, sorry, Harry Baines, the spirit of Harry Baines came over me. Yes, exactly. They, uh, <laughs> oh. here's, if you, there's only a couple ways this is going to end. Either the BCTF will go on strike, which I think both sides realize is a disaster. I think the public will eventually figure out that the teachers tend to go on strike, uh, no matter who's in power, and they'll start losing sympathy there. Uh, the NDP will, of course, uh, eat that as any government would in a, in a school disruption. Or this is when things would get interesting. I could see the BCTF, um, let's say a year from now or six months from now, things aren't moving, they kind of want to kick the ball to the next election. They'll, they'll, they'll agree to a very temporary short-term, like one-year deal that gets them through the election. And then if the BC Liberals are in power, they can go, they can go on the attack again without feeling a shred of remorse. Or um, they'll be kind of giving what they think is a stay of execution to the NDP. Okay, two years, you can get your house in order. Maybe you'll have a majority government then, you can give us what we want. But that'll be kind of like, if, if you see the, the BCTF agreeing to a short-term deal, um, which would be outside the mandate because it's supposed to be three years, then you'll know that the BCTF is hedging their bets in the election. Yeah. The hilarious thing about these mandates is, you know, the NDP claimed that the BC Liberals were such horrible people managers and, you know, couldn't, ha couldn't negotiate their way out of a paper a bag. And yet they've adopted the precise idea of everyone gets the same percentage across the board, the Me Too clauses that the Liberals pioneered and that proved very effective in bringing all of these unions to heel, except admittedly the TF, although the TF did eventually settle for that same thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Liberals were very successful, for example, with the sharing the uh, economic growth uh, mandate. And there was one cycle before the Olympics where they got labor peace with the, the public sector unions by offering them a bonus, sign ahead of time, you know, everyone walks out of here with 3,500 bucks in their pockets. That was, of course, very successful. So, you know, for all this, you know, criticism, oh, for 16 years, we were a bleak uh, horror show when it came to labor negotiations. The Liberals actually had labor peace. And lo and behold, the NDP have adopted uh, a few of their tricks along the way. So I don't know why a former labor minister sitting on the uh, uh, BC Liberal side don't stand up in question period and point that out. But I'm sure it's coming. <laughs> they got two left. Yeah, they got two left. It's not too late. All right, uh, tunnel pushback. Mm -hmm. uh, we're starting to see more and more groups come out against the uh, foolish uh, John Horgan tunnel plan. As you'll recall, McLean, uh, Christy Clark had approved a 10-lane bridge at the Massey uh, Tunnel to replace the Massey Tunnel. Uh, he had received all the environmental approvals necessary. Preloading had begun. $100 million had been spent. Um, it would be more than 50% complete today. The bids that come in on building the bridge, it was $900 million under budget. Not an insignificant amount. No. 900 <laughs> schmill. Pretty damn good. Um, and then John Horgan got elected and immediately canceled it because, well, he wanted to pay his union brother more uh, to work on other transportation projects through the sweetheart deal at the union uh, the collective bargaining agreements um, and you know frankly just kind of ran out of money and doesn't really care that much about this issue in general uh, forced into a corner by ICBA and other groups this year he came out and said oh no we'll do an eight-lane replacement tunnel 
Uh, you do the math. There's three lanes uh, one way now during rush hour. Uh, there'll be three lanes one way during rush hour then. Um, and then a, a dedicated transit lane. So not great. Uh, and you know, for a while uh, it was quiet. Not a lot of groups were coming out uh, opposing this plan. To their credit, Tawasa First Nation did. Uh, mm -hmm. We certainly did. And then the uh, Richmond Chamber of Commerce came out and said, no, no, come on, smart up. This needs to be a bridge. And now you have uh, the BC Trucking Association jumping in. They've analyzed and said, no, the bridge is the superior plan. Better for the environment, better for safety, better for uh, for our drivers, for commuters. Let's do that instead. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I just go back to the f fiscal report that Carol James gave. There's no money in there for massy tunnels mm -hmm. or bridges. Um, you know, the, the only thing John Horgan wants to do really is punt this past the next election and, and hopefully not have to deal with it again. That was exactly what I was going to ask you. Do you think that this is sort of a way of hitting this news button on this project and, and not having to deal with it for four years? Or do you think they just bungled it? And I think you just answered. Do you think it's a, you think uh, it's a punt? I think, they, I think they bungled it. I think George Harvey, the mayor of Delta, got hoodwinked by better politicians. Uh, he was very firmly in the bridge camp before election, got elected, thought he'd cut a deal with Malcolm Brody on this eight lane tunnel and, and uh, you know, went along with John Horgan and then suddenly realized, wait a minute, Horgan doesn't have environmental approvals, doesn't have First Nations approvals, doesn't have a budget for it, and has set the project back 10 years. And I think now uh, it's caused a major rift between him and Lois Jackson, it's caused a major rift between George Harvey and Ian Patton. Uh, mm -hmm. These are former allies who had worked in lockstep on getting this bridge built. Um, one of them went rogue, got snookered by the uh, uh, the big boys in Richmond and in the NDP headquarters, and you know now the mayor of Delta should be, well, should be held accountable for blowing this deal, uh, uh, blowing this deal on behalf of his constituents. See what happens when you don't build bridges. You don't build bridges, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yep. Look, look, and la look. ICBA, we have a direct, you know, we're. We have a direct interest in this. Like many of our yes. companies have been contracted to do the work, or would have, or were in the bidding to do the work. Um, you know, I've I've spoken to people who, you know, had crewed up on uh, dump mm -hmm. trucks, um, had bought extra trucks in order to do the preloads. The contract was canceled summarily. They don't get the money back for the trucks they bought in order to, you know, provide to, to do that work. So let's put them uh, on a razor's edge. Um, I'm not going to sit here and pretend we don't have an interest in it because, of course, we do. We want to build stuff. Um, but you know, you, you do want to build the right projects, the ones that are going to last for a long time, because you know you want people to have confidence in the infrastructure you're building. Um, a tunnel, it, it's just so many different problems there, and it, it's just pure, yeah, it's just political gamesmanship by John Horgan. And you know, frankly, I, I hope it costs him a couple, maybe more seats in Delta and Surrey next election. Um, I was going to talk about an NDP cabinet minister here, but I'm gonna let's let's apparently there's an announcement from Andrew Weaver coming up uh, immediately after question period today. Let's talk about that instead because it's more fun. Okay, wild speculation. So he, all he's done is throw out there after question period, come see me in the rotunda. I have an announcement. Yeah. A personal announcement about the leadership a race. Personal announcement. So I think obviously he's going to stay neutral. Yeah, I think that would be the announcement. But you have a theory as to what. Why now? And and what what could kind of be? The, and I will underscore this by saying, if you're watching this, uh, Dr. Weaver, and you probably are, this is wild speculation, and I'm prefacing this with this. Um, what I, if I have to guess, I think that of his uh, two caucus mates, one has decided to run for leader, and the other has not. Uh, and so, um, if if they were both running for leader, or they were neither running for leader, that would it would be a different situation. But let's say, for argument's sake, that Adam Olson is running for leader, and Sonia Furston now is not. If that is the case, then I believe that uh, Weaver will step down more immediately as leader and let the person who's not running uh, be interim leader. Uh, and that way, uh, sort of, they all get sort of the spotlight. It's I mean, it's it's what would happen in a larger caucus as well. Um, now again. That's what I think is going to happen, but it is informed by nothing other than wild speculation. They have not, they have not hinted at me that this is what's coming. Okay, first of all, can you imagine being a party leader in charge of Andrew Weaver? <laughs> Second of all, here's the problem with this. It, you might be right, and let, but if you were applying typical political theory to this, you'd say, eh, I don't know if that's going to work because yeah. you would want Olson to have his own announcement. I'm in yep. for the leadership, green balloons falling, people, you know, uh, you know, multiracial faces behind him. Like the, you know, the, the standard I'm running for leader kind of, we're going to build momentum and go on. 
this just completely short circuits that, right? Like, yeah. I mean, then it becomes so blatantly obvious that one of them is running, one of them isn't. You like, you wonder, you wonder about that. But then again, maybe, maybe the Green Party can't fill a room like that. Like, maybe they can't have that big launch. Maybe that's well, just that, antithetical, you know, uh, antithetical yeah. to their culture. I, I, I'm not going to profess to understand green politics at this point. Well, and there's, there might be other things at play. Uh, you know, ha Weaver had health issues earlier this year, and he may be deciding that, you know, now that he's made the decision not to run again, you know, I really can, Weaver really can step back and let his other two do more. I, I can see that. That's plausible as well. I mean, it's, it's uh, that aside, it's kind of funny in that it, there's two three-person green caucuses in Victoria and in Ottawa. And if Weaver does step down today, then uh, as is a leader immediately, then we'll have kind of two parallel situations where Elizabeth may step down, but she's still on all of the news releases and, you know, doing all the things. And it doesn't look like anything has actually changed. She's just, you know, nominally not the leader anymore. It would be, it would be kind of odd if we had a similar situation here. Uh, true, true. Hey, it could just be Dr. Weaver has Christmas gifts to give the press gallery. <laughs> it's, it's entirely possible, in which case I will gladly receive them. But, yeah, um, yeah we don't know. Yeah, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see. And, and of course, by the time most of you listen or see this, uh, the idle speculation sure. will have turned to reality and uh, McLean will be either uh, vindicated or humiliated. Uh, much like he was humiliated in our CFL Grey Cup bet, yes, I will yep. be collecting you, my free... You were, uh, all the, you were all the way right on that one, weren't you? Well, that wasn't close. Well, first of all, you always got to go with the West. True. Num number one. They just play tougher competition, so you're more finely honed for those big games. Like, you know... 18 games or whatever the Haley played, mm -hmm. 12 games against Ottawa and yeah. Toronto is not going to hone you for uh, for success True. in a big in a big game setting. Number one, number two, um, look, th there was a guy there who hadn't worn pants for 18 years. <laughs> Winnipeg was desperate. They were desperate. Not in Winnipeg. In Winnipeg, I mean, you get away with not wearing pants. Shoveling in snow in minus 15. <laughs> That's minus 15 if you're lucky. God bless that man's wife if he's married. Um, uh, he is married, and uh, his wife is on record as calling her husband an idiot. Yeah, that woman is a saint. That woman is a saint. I would like to see a statue built to her um, <laughs> somewhere in Winnipeg um, yes. for putting up with this nonsense. Or some sort of plaque, perhaps. At, uh, is it still Canada in Fields, or what do they call it now? Whatever. The... Uh, no, it's um, invest. Invesco? No, I can't Investors remember. Bank or something? I don't know. It doesn't yeah. matter. Okay, I want to talk about one more politician before we go, and yep. it's Andrew Scheer. Um, yes. As you recall, Andrew Scheer uh, ran for Prime Minister, McLean. Uh, he, he was, <laughs> he's the Conservative <laughs> Party vague leader. memories of that, yes. Conservative Party leader, apparently, and the uh, leader of the official opposition, and apparently can be found in Stornoway uh, at any given time. Here's the problem. He most... Uh, uh, Pundits would say, hey, the reason why this guy lost the election is he was too socially conservative, uh, you know, and uh, pro-life, uh, you know, did not come out strongly in any sort of way for, uh, for uh, same-sex marriage, yeah. uh, had people, had LGBTQ uh, community very concerned about what, you know, his views were on their rights, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he, he did not have uh, ringing answers for these questions. So, uh, after having lost election for being apparently too socially conservative, um, I was astounded to see the news release from uh, whatever the social conservative uh, groups are saying they've lost confidence in Andrew Scheer as a leader. This is just like this is like the 2017 Maple Ridge election all over again, where the social conservatives ran a BC conservative candidate against Mark Dalton because Mark Dalton, the most socially conservative uh, MLA the BC Liberals had, wasn't socially conservative enough. Like, what? Okay, so if Sheer doesn't have the social conservatives, and he doesn't have the fiscal conservatives, who does he have? It's yeah. over. It's over, Andrew. It's over, Andrew Sheer. You might as well step aside, let someone else uh, take a crack at this, because I, I just don't know, like, if, you, you gotta have one of these camps, right? Like, you, you gotta have someone supporting you. I, I fear that Andrew Sheer in the uh, impending membership vote on his leadership. Uh, he may not crack 50%. Like, this, this could be humiliating for him. Yeah, it's, um, I, I, I think you're right. I don't disagree with you. If, uh, if I was uh, counseling Andrew Scheer, and if Andrew Scheer was keenly aware of BC politics, I might tell him to, to look at someone like Adrian Dix. Mm -hmm. uh, ran, ran for election. Um, uh, a lot of people thought he would win. Didn't, obviously. <laughs> um, 
And but as since, you know, I think um, restored his reputation a little bit. I mean, he could have gone down as like the guy who blew the biggest lead in in, uh, in Canadian political history, which is still true. Yeah. But uh, he's now the minister I was of told health. Once, I was told once that he could kick a puppy and still be a dog, premier. a dog and still win the election. And yeah. I, he should have kicked it because um, <laughs> maybe that would have helped. But um, the point is, he's now the minister of health and uh, yeah. a fairly well respected one. Um, you know, if I'm if I'm Andrew Shear or if I'm counseling him, I say, okay, you know what, the prime minister thing is is not going to happen. But if you go out on your own terms and set the party up for success, there's every chance they might win the next election, and you will also be a you know a high profile. Stockwell um, Day is a good example. Exactly. That's maybe even a better one. And so, like, th- this doesn't have to be the end. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's the end of your <laughs> of, of being of chasing the dream of prime minister, at least for now. I think. But, um, you know, that, that doesn't mean disgrace. Yeah. No, look, Andrew Scheer, uh, you know, Andrew Scheer is a, because you see Andrew Scheer is a, you know, foreign affairs minister, probably. Absolutely. You know, yeah. uh, an intergovernmental minister with his, his speaker, his speaker experience. Yeah. Is, you know, I think there's lots of career paths open to him. I, I just don't see now where he can generate enough support to hang in there. He might as well, somebody's just got to pull the bandaid off and, you know, and go with it. Um, that said, I'm not sure there's some any shining, you know, who the shining star would be to to do better than that. But uh, I don't know. There's no point in repeating the experiment. No, I agree. I I don't, and I I think the 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 lack of tolerance for all the um, the issues you mentioned before of you know the LGBTQ and same sex marriage and all that stuff that that is not going to get better. From yeah. Andrew Shear's point of view, I, I think is going to be more pressure to do things like march and pride parades and yeah. and say things about same sex marriage that uh, I I don't think that's going to get any easier for him or anyone else. Yeah, you know, as time goes on, um, like, it, there's an important moment now where I think people can come forward because people still remember the discomfort that, frankly, the vast majority of Canadians had with same sex marriage, for example, yeah. as, as recently as 15 years ago. Obama yeah. was opposed to it in 2008. But Clinton's passed the defense of marriage law. Like, these are, you know, definite, like, there's a definite shift. And if, you know, you're a leader, come out and, you know, if you'd come out and said, listen, 15 years ago I gave that speech in the House. Um, like a lot of Canadians then, I was concerned about this. But as yeah. we've seen uh, society evolve, as we've seen the laws evolve, you know, I've really come to, this, come to the conclusion that individual rights are you know, the cornerstone of the conservative coalition. And we mm-hmm. shouldn't have been opposing it. We should have been supporting it. We should have been saying, hey, you know, everyone has a right to choose. You know, everyone has a right for their personal freedoms. Like, who are we to impose, you know, lenses onto other people's personal freedoms? I don't want that done to me. It shouldn't be done to other people. And just talk about the evolution between then and now. Uh, of course, if he had done that, he would have risked alienated social conservative voters, but they've just jumped off the bridge, you know, jumped off the uh, sheer train. Well, exactly. Anyways. Yeah. And, uh, you know, speaking as a uh, person who grew up in an evangelical Christian church, who, you know, still attends church, not as much as I should right now because it's hockey season and jacket and Packer season, and, you know, there's a lot of conflicting things on Sundays, but who definitely believes. Uh, I've evolved in my thinking, you know, mm-hmm. my family's involved in their thinking. You know, we've come to the conclusion that, you know, this is okay, you know. Yeah. And, and, like, have that open conversation. It would have set everyone's minds at ease, you know. But at the same time, if he's not there, he can't do it because he can't do it authentically. Yeah, exactly. And he yeah. seems so uncomfortable on those questions all the time that maybe that maybe authentically he just could not get to that point or there was this political still tie that he couldn't quite sever. Um but yeah, I'm I'm a big I'm a big believer in like, it's okay for people to evolve and change on this. Yeah, if Obama and Biden and the Clintons and you know like, yeah. they opposed it, no one considers them bigots or. Yeah. Oh, Jean Chrétien, who I worked for, was uh, was firmly opposed to same-sex marriage. Yeah. Uh, and he was typical of the thinking of the time. Um, he has evolved in his thinking. Uh, it's, there's no reason but people can't do the same. It's just like it's just like you know our our parents or maybe better our grandparents' generation, McLean, opposing a divorce. Yeah. Yeah, like divorce was a shameful thing. Oh my God! Like they would throw divorce people at churches. Like this was a big deal. You got divorced, you lost your social standing, your social circle. You were a yeah. pariah. You often you had to move towns. Like 
That doesn't happen anymore. Why? Because society has evolved. We've realized that there's often very valid reasons. It's better to be happy and apart than to be together and miserable. You know, like yes. it's changed. Like there's there's been healing there. There's you know, like okay, we, we can do this, right? Um, you know, you can apply it to all sorts of issues. You know, the thinking's on residential schools. It's a yes. shameful chapter in Canadian history. It's something that we're still all coming to terms with, you know, the pain. And, and by the way, just before we go, amazing story on the ORCA. Talk about that residential school before we go, because this is not a, this transcends politics, but it's yeah. the kind of story that gave me chills when I read it. Oh, yeah. Uh, Frank Peebles, who did amazing work for the Prince, Ger Prince George Citizen and is now going to be doing amazing work for the Orca. It started with a story about uh, First Nation just past uh, Fraser Lake, and I'm going to get the name wrong, so I'm not going to try. But um, they had a notorious residential school, and I mean notorious even by the standards of residential schools. Um, if you it, don't Google it while you're alone is what I'm going to say. It's, it's really bad. Uh, and they had been told that this school, the school, the, the, the physical school had been completely demolished. And while they were doing work, uh, on a, a work camp, uh, they had signed, uh, and they still have, um, uh, a benefits agreement with uh, coastal gas link and it signed a really good deal. And they were very happy about it, which is another good story. But while, as they were doing the physical work, they came across the foundations and indeed the basements of this old residential school. And I mean, for them, it was very much like, you know, unearthing ghosts because yeah. there were, you talk to people even off the record up there, Frank was telling me, I mean, they heard terrible things about some of the things that had happened in those basements. Um, and I don't want to get into them here, but I mean, it's just horrifying stuff. And for them to actually find those basements was, was jarring and, uh, and I think traumatic. And so, I mean, this is the kind of thing that like people like you and I just don't have to deal with. And, uh, you know, when we talk about it, it's only academic for them. It's, it's a real thing. And now, unfortunately, it's a real physical thing. I mean, the, the shot that Frank took that's, um, in the story shows you that the, where they live, I mean, it's literally a stone throw from, um, this heap that they had thought was the demolished building, but it, it really was just literally covered up, uh, literally and figuratively. So yeah, it's, um, it's well worth a read. Yeah, it's the kind of uh, story that we, you know, doesn't get covered by a lot of outlets, and you know, we should be proud that it's on the Orca for sure. Absolutely. All right, um, we will be back next week, uh, probably Tuesday, um, if it's okay with McLean. It's uh, ICBA board meetings on Wednesday, so you know, I gotta, well, gotta schmooze. Without the house sitting, I'm a little more flexible. Exactly. So yes. Exactly. He'll be uh, much more casual. There'll be no tie. That's true. It's, uh, so uh, it'll be like, uh, like uh, I was going to say, it's going to be like hot stove off the record. <laughs> it's going to be great. All right. But we will be back uh, next Tuesday. And uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you.